pubblico in piedi ad ogni And the fans are on their feet going wild at every corner. Haga tries to get the slipstream. Watch out as Haga now tries to break hard into the first chicane. Now it's Edwards in the lead and Bayliss. Bayliss absolutely incredible. The Australian with the number 21 in for Strada Ducati has taken over at the front with a killer pass as they break into the first chicane. The Australian is amazing. He doesn't know Cole Fogarty's factory in for Strada bike. He doesn't know the Michelin tyres and he's never even raced at Monza before. Yet once again he's shown what he's made of in this battle of the giants. Troy the Wonder Boy, aka Troy Bayliss, is not just any old story. It's actually a bit of a fairy tale. It's the story of a rider from Down Under who not only conquered victories on the racetrack, but also hearts. And with his winning smile, he gave us the impression that it was easy and natural to race like this, to win like this, to do exceptional things on a bike like overtaking four of his rivals in one go, as he did at Monza one afternoon. But being Troy Bayliss requires an extraordinary, unique talent, because there was no one like him. Instinctive and crazy, predatory and sensitive at the same time. Tremendously fast and furious, but devoid of any weird ideas in his head, as if challenging fate was truly without consequences, as if dancing between the curves on a motorbike was only linked to the aim of crossing the finish line first and then smiling that beautiful, naive, adolescent smile. Just this, finishing first without any calculations, without thinking back on anything, without any malice except for what normal competitive activity on the track produces. So let's open the throttle, sit back and enjoy Troy the Wonder Boy. What a story. It all started well before bikes. It was the last year of the 1960s when Troy Andrew Bayliss came into this world on March the 30th in Tauri, New South Wales, Australia. It's a slice of the ocean that has always produced fast men on wheels, both two and four. Two examples. In Queensland, 500 kilometers to the north, nothing by Australian standards, Mick Doohan was born just a few years earlier, one of the five greatest riders in the history of the premier class of the World Championship. And in New Zealand, on the other side of the Tasman Sea, Chris Amon, one of the fastest drivers of all time in Formula One, who in March 1969 was racing the South African Grand Prix with Ferrari, had taken his first steps. I always wanted to be a racer, said Troy. I'd been riding a motorcycle since I was four. I'd go out the back door and into the bush for about 10 miles. I was free. From mini bikes to dirt track and motocross, it wasn't a very big step. And at the age of 10, Troy began to nurture the dream of becoming a professional road racer. But to race seriously, you need a fundamental component, money. And Troy didn't have any. The dream seemed as if it was over. And after completing his studies, he began to work as an apprentice spray painter at Joe Berry's machine shop. And it was precisely from this job that he earned the nickname in the early years of his career. His dream of becoming a racer had not been broken. It had just been put aside for the moment. As a child, Troy was shy with those he didn't know well. But with his friends, he showed the daredevil he was, Troy's parents used to say. When he was a spray painter, he started cycling to work. Every day, as soon as he got home, he threw himself on the bed, completely exhausted. I said to him, slow down, why are you doing this? He replied that he was always trying to get his time down. Scott McCluskey was Troy's childhood friend. He, Kim and I have known each other for a long time, ever since Troy worked at Joe Berry's machine shop, he said. I was working in a bank in Tari at the time. When we met, we immediately became friends, united by a passion for triathlon and cycling. We didn't have any money or furniture. We still lived in our parents' house and drove old cars. But we had nice bicycles for which we were willing to do anything. 
Vike was our only treasure. Kim Evans was the girl who would become Troy's wife. Kim and I met in my room as kids, Troy said. I was 18, she was 16. One day, coming back from the beach, she was in my room with my sister and a friend of theirs. She asked me to go dancing with her, but I guess she didn't have any choice as her friend already had a date. I'm happy I accepted. Kim would become the woman of his life. My life with Troy is a roller coaster ride, she explained. I knew I was in trouble as soon as I saw those eyes, but I still had no idea what the future would hold for me. Sometimes it's not easy for me to tell if Troy is my husband or my fourth child. He gets along very well in both roles. Troy has always been a perfectionist. When he was a spray painter, when he went on a bike, when he did triathlon and then on a motorcycle. I've never known anyone so severe with himself, but that's probably what made him a winner. Because that's what Troy did as soon as he got the chance. He became a winner. As soon as I could drive a car, I took out a loan and bought a Kawasaki 750 while mum and dad were on vacation, said Troy. I soon realised that I was doing crazy things on the street. I was going too fast, and if things hadn't changed, I would have ended up in jail or even at the cemetery. So I started racing on the track. In 1992, at the age of 23, his and Kim's savings he bought his first racing bike and entered the Australian 250 GP Championship. The following year, he moved to the 600 class and, above all, married Kim. At first, we didn't know what to think of this boy with long hair, a cheeky smile and, worse still, a battered car, who intended to go out with our precious daughter, said Max and Linda Evans, Kim's parents. Then, over time, Troy became part of the family and we became good friends. When he bought a motorcycle to start racing, we thought that at least racing would be safer on the track. We were passionate about it from his very first victory in Oran Park, and our life changed, so much so that Max became Troy's mechanic. But it was in 1997 that things really stepped up a gear. In the year in which Doohan won his third world title, Troy, at the age of 28, entered the motorcycle racing world big time. In March, he raced a Suzuki at Phillip Island as a wild card in World Superbike, picking up two fifth places. And in October, again on a Suzuki, he took part in the Australian Grand Prix in the 250cc class, finishing sixth, just a fraction away from the podium, as he himself tells us. The story for me, when people actually learnt that was somebody called Troy Bayless was in 97 uh, and I happened to be riding the Australian Superbike Championship at the time with Suzuki. We did the wildcard World Superbike race and I, I had two good finishes there. I finished two fifth places which was pretty good on, a, on, a, um, you know, on an Australian level motorcycle like we, we did a good job against the, the world guys, against the top guys. And that turned around uh, later on in the year. Um, one of the guys from the team Molinar Suzuki, one of the riders, a Japanese guy was sick and um, to cut a long story short, eventually they asked if I'd like to ride the bike and I said, yeah, of course, it'd be, it'd be pretty good. I went into the injured, I'd just come back from a couple of broken vertebrae and uh, to be an incredible race for me. From that moment on, everything really started to move fast and not just on the track. In 1998, he was signed by Ducati to race in the British Superbike Championship, which he won the following year. Ducati promoted him and in 2000 he was in America, taking part in the AMA Superbike Championship. But he wouldn't have much time to settle down. In race 2 of the second round of the Superbike World Championship at Phillip Island in Australia, Carl Fogarty, four times world champion and Ducati's top rider, crashed so badly that it would eventually turn out to be his last race. Typical Davide, Troy, you're coming to Sugo, pack your bags. Let's hear from the former rider and then manager of the Ducati Superbike team since 1993, Davide Tardozzi. Unfortunately, the first time out for Troy when Fogarty got hurt, when we called him to race in Japan, he was in Australia. Maybe it was on a track that was not traditionally friendly to us, Sugo, and with Michelin tyres too, that in Japan had never really been high performing, since in the Japanese championship they ran with Dunlop tyres. 
Anyway, Troy was 11th quickest in practice, which wasn't bad. Thinking back to the year before, he actually did better than Fogarty in terms of lap times, but Dunlop tyres had very high performing qualifying tyres. Having said that, unfortunately in race 1 they mowed him down at the first corner. In race 2 they mowed him down again at the third corner. It wasn't his fault, and he didn't even finish a race. There was no way to be able to judge him though, especially after what he'd done during practice and qualifying. And I tell you, with all these different circumstances, I think he didn't go bad really. It all seemed over, because we were also very interested in the American Championship. So Troy was sent to the US after winning the British Championship, because we were banking on him winning the AMA title. Then it became clear that the Fogarty incident had created different priorities. Then, there was the next race after Japan which was Donington, and we had an idea of racing with Luca Cadalora. Anyway, that didn't work out too well, and after that, the fourth round was in Monza, so we called Troy back. In 2000, the fifth round of the World Superbike Championship was held that year at Monza. And it was here in race one that Troy Bayliss accomplished the first of his legendary feats. The guys asked me if I'd like to come back from Monza, which was another weird one because I'd never been there before either. And um, honestly, I didn't want to go because just the way things were going, Ducati was struggling a lot. I had some difficult times in Sugo, and, but I mean, between Davida and um, Paolo and Kim, they talked me into giving it another go and the rest is history. And the bikes are coming out of Ascari on the warm-up lap before the 18-lap race of Round 5 of the Superbike World Championship. It was the first of the two races that would take place that day. Let's hear from Pier Francesco Keeley, who won from Colin Edwards by just 28 thousandths of a second. I have an incredible memory of that time at Monza, when Troy, as you can hear from De Pilo's commentary on television, did that amazing braking move to pass four riders at the first chicane, with De Pilo going absolutely crazy. And from Paolo Ciabatti, Ducati's Superbike Programme Director from 1999 to 2007. He probably did the most amazing piece of braking in history, because in the first chicane he passed, if I'm not mistaken, Yanagawa, Kili, and Colin Edwards, all in one go, and he took the lead. He eventually finished fourth in both races, but in that moment, he won a place in our hearts. He twice finished fourth, and Ducati then took him to Hockenheim, where two weeks after his exploit at Monza, Troy won his first World Superbike race. But what was his secret? We hear from Davide Tardozzi. From a rider point of view, I don't think there's much more to add, really, to what he's demonstrated on track. Troy was a very talented rider, with very few strange ideas in his head. He arrived at success late, but whose physique supported him until he retired. Bayliss was one rider who could really make a difference. Yes, he made all the difference above all, in the moments like Fogarty when there were problems. When there weren't any problems, let's say that he was probably more or less like all the other riders. But true champions really emerge when there are problems, and he put in that little bit extra. But Troy also seemed to win on a human level as well. Everyone liked him because he was a true star of motorcycle racing, despite being a very down-to-earth person. As Keeley can also confirm. He was always a gentleman, both on and off the track. We're not talking about a new kid on the block. We're talking about Troy Bayliss. He had a very unusual riding style, leaning out a bit, not exactly like McDoohan, but a similar style something that Jack Miller imitates a bit like now. But it was very effective, and he was very good at setting up the bike. And above all, he knew when he could win. The year 2000 ended with 10 podiums, including two victories, but it was only a foretaste of the year to come. 2001 was, I was really riding aggressive and I'd try very hard and um, it turned out to be you know, a great year for me to win the first world championship was always very special, but it was like, I rode well and uh, it was all good but I still didn't have that belief in myself or confidence and was always changing the bike and uh, I was always just riding like out of my comfort zone I guess you could say. With six wins and numerous placings to his name and backed up by an amazing Ducati 996R, Bayliss was crowned world champion, thus writing his name in the elite of the production based championship. Second place, but not far behind, was Colin Edwards, who had won the title in 2000. But if 2001 was exciting, it paled in comparison with 2002. That year turned out to be a truly amazing championship, 
one in which Troy scored his highest number of wins, 14, and his record number of points in a season. But, and there was a big but. I think that on that occasion he was very unlucky. He didn't win the world title. He came to Imola just a few points behind Colin Edwards, and I remember it well. He didn't win because he had bad luck when the red flags came out three or four laps from the end, which brought the race to an early finish. Opting for a hard tyre while Edwards chose a softer one, he had banked on the final part of the race. He'd caught Edwards, but then unfortunately there was a crash. Can't remember who the rider was, but the bike remained on the track and race direction brought out the red flags. I honestly think he could have won that race, but unfortunately he didn't and he lost five more points to Colin. And at that point in race two, he had to win and someone else had to get between him and Colin Edwards because there was seven or eight points differential between them. He did the whole race trying to get his teammates uh, Ruben Zaus to catch up and to hold up Colin, but in the end he didn't even win the race because in trying to catch Zaus and Colin and pass them both, well Zaus just wasn't fast enough basically. In any case, losing by 10 points or 1 point, it didn't change anything. We didn't win the title. And this, as Davide Tardozzi mentioned, was the second exploit that helped to cement Bayliss as a legend. We were at Imola in 2002, the final round of the Superbike World Championship. The top two in the standings, Edwards and Bayliss, were divided by just one point. Edwards was in the lead and Troy had to win. The first half of the year for me was incredible. I was just winning like non-stop. And then, then the wheels sort of fell off the wagon. I crashed in uh, Laguna and then I had another crash in Assen. But by the time it came to Assen, Assen, that was when it sort of really you know, I went there with like a really good points lead and it fell apart and then, then it just come down to um, a one race, a one weekend, winner take all and, um, and that's just how it goes actually in the end. The first got 25 points, the second 20. Two races were held in each World Championship round. The race in the World Championship will be fought out between the number two Colin Edwards and Ducati's World Champion class rider. Troy Bayliss attacks and takes the lead. Bayliss at the S's, then the Villeneuve chicane. Fantastic wheelie by Bayliss, who was once again enjoying riding his 998. An attack by Edwards. Incredible once again, now back in the lead. What a battle at close to 220 kilometers an hour. Bayliss tries an attack at the Piratella and he now retakes the lead, but he's passed once again by Colin Edwards. The bike is sideways at the top of the Aqua Minerale, really one of the greatest races in motorcycle history. Once again, they cross the line at record pace on this fantastic Imola circuit. A fantastic battle between these two giants of world motorcycle racing. It's Edwards against Bayliss. And it's an attack now at the Tosa. At the S's and Villeneuve by Bayliss where he finds Edwards on the inside line. They touch a fantastic finale. Bayliss, Edwards once again up against each other. Bayliss attacks at the Piratella and again he takes the lead. Taking incredible risk, he has to roll off the throttle and now it's Edwards back in front. A heart-stopping finale. Unforgettable. There's just 400 metres left to end the World Superbike Championship and it's Edwards who determinedly holds off the attacks of Troy Bayliss to become the 2002 World Champion. Colin Edwards on the Castrol Honda VTR with this victory deservedly takes the number one plate. It's an unfortunate end but a fantastic finale by Troy Bayliss. Troy twice finished second and the title went to Edwards. But that day in Imola, Bayliss produced one of the most amazing races ever seen, both in his life and in superbike history. He knew the only thing he had to do was win. In any case, that was the Troy I knew in later years, a Troy who never gave up, someone who knew that at that moment, although the Honda VTR was a superior bike, he tried until the very last few metres of race two to finish ahead of Edwards, even though he couldn't do it that Sunday. But Troy was as tough as leather and determined to do the impossible with the bike that he had underneath him. That was how Lorenzo Lanzi, his future teammate, remembers him. Those never-ending laps, two tremendously ferocious but also loyal riders. The battle between eternal rivals Ducati and Honda heralded a crazy 2003 season. But that wasn't to be the case. Moving in perfect synchrony like actors in a ballet, Bayliss and Edwards opted to abandon any thoughts of one final Conrad-like duel and both moved up into MotoGP, once again with their rival Ducati and Honda team.
Next by Luca Delicari, narration by Julian Thomas and Michael Hill, with the voices of Troy Bayliss, Pier Francesco Chili, Paolo Ciabatti, Lorenzo Lanzi, and Davide Tardozzi. Italian commentary by Giovanni Di Pillo. For the quotes, courtesy, a man, a rider, a legend. Sport Review Production. <laughs> 